Good evening, fellow readers of Exploring God's Library. We're making progress. We are in week number 26. That's a portion 20. Huh? 26, uh, 8th. And it is uh, Tuesday, uh, April, April 9th. <laughs> And if you're new, you're more than welcome to join us on the journey this spring as we read through God's Library, as revealed in His Library, 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The discipline of Bible reading is designed to complement your study of the Bible. It's a necessary component of your daily walk with God along with fellowship at a local church. This is how the Bible reading program works out. It only takes 20 minutes a day if you read straight through the select passages. The scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, are composed of 39 books widely known as the Old Testament. The first five books are known in Hebrew as the Torah, the Law, or in Greek as the Pentateuch, the Five Scrolls. Each day we begin by reading a portion from the Torah called a Parsha, and in one year we systematically read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This religious reading calendar dates back to the 6th century B.C. <clears throat> and it was established during the 70-year exile of the Jewish community known as the Babylonian captivity. To this day, everyone reads from the same chapters, which makes it easier to discuss their word on a daily basis. Now, we've applied this to the entire Bible, and so um, we'll then sequentially read through an assigned portion from the historic books, and the major and the minor prophets. Additionally, we will read from the wisdom literature, the psalm of the day, uh, the same seven psalms on a weekly basis, and then one of the 150 psalms each day. In that way, we'll cover the 150 psalms twice in a year. And then we'll read one or two proverbs, intentionally slowing down so that we might meditate on that passage during the day, applying the biblical idea of line upon line, precept upon precept. Finally, each day, we read a chapter from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. Most every Tuesday evening, we'll review our readings and provide commentary, like this evening, drawn from various suggested resources. If you're not able to make it at that time, we'll post a link to that on exploringgodslibrary.org. Um, or um, what we would highly recommend is that you subscribe to the Exploring God's Library private Facebook page doesn't cost you anything, and there's a lot of material that's already posted there from YouTube, etc. We do a lot of searching on YouTube for some of the best sermons on, on like for example tonight, um, we'll talk a little bit about a sermon by R.C. Sproul on, on justification by faith, the difference between the Roman Catholic version and between the Protestant version of, of exploring, of, of, of justification by faith. And that will really help you understand uh, the nuances of explaining that, especially when you're talking to your Roman Catholic friends or family. And um, uh, also, one of the things we've done is we do have a calendar, and that calendar will make it very easy for you to follow the readings every day. And it goes along with the seasons of the year and uh, you know, the different holidays. You know, for, for example, we're coming up to Passover, you know, we just passed uh, uh, up the week of the Passion, you know, Resurrection Sunday, um, so Resurrection Week. And so um, it's in sync with the calendar. And um, also, um, we do have, uh, on posted on our page, I think it's at the top, the, it's, a, it's a, cat, a, a listing of all the YouTube videos. And there's a lot of, how many? about 1,300 videos. And these 1,300 videos look at MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, um, all these different um, uh, all these different scholars and, and preachers. And, and so you get a really, and uh, like uh, Ryan Reeves from, from um, uh, Gordon Conwell talking about some of the early church fathers. And so we have historic figures and then we have, we have present uh, pastors and some past uh, pastors like um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, etc. And these will be explaining the, the doctrines of grace or the, you know, 
a lot of the, the reform doctrines. So it takes you carefully through these things. And, um, and a lot of archaeologists, ar archaeological discoveries, and that uh, really help illuminate uh, the Word of God. And so uh, it's, it's well worth subscribing to. Um, and we always come up with new things that we find. It's said in the Westminster Shorter Catechism that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The Word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Now, this is a devotional we'll read tonight. It's uh, drawn from the Valley Vision, which we do each week. And, uh, and so uh, it's a great template to kind of pray through. You can add some things as you pray. Uh, and so um, uh, let's pray. O Lord of the oceans, our little boat sails on a restless sea. Grant that Jesus, our Lord, may sit at its helm and stir us safely. Suffer no adverse currents to divert our heavenward course. Let not faith, our faith, be wrecked amid storms or shoals. Bring to us to harbor with flying pennants, whole and breached, cargo unspoiled. We ask great things, expect great things. It sounds like a, a prayer from William Carey. Expect great things from God. Shall receive great things. We venture on you wholly, fully, to be our wind, our sunshine, our anchor, and our defense. The voyage is long, the waves high, the storms often pitiless, but we trust our helm is held steady. Your word secures safe passage. Your grace wafts us onward as the apostle was guided through the torturous hurricane force winds, the Euroclidon. Our haven, we know, is guaranteed. This day will bring us nearer to home, may not be without trials, but this day will bring us nearer home. Grant us holy consistency in every transaction, our peace flowing as a running tide, our righteousness as every chasing wave. Help us to live circumspectly, with skill to convert every care into prayer. Hallow our pray path with gentleness and love. Smooth every gruffness of temper. Let us not forget how easy it is to occasion grief. May we strive to bind up every wound and pour oil on all the troubled waters that we encounter. May, the wor may this world, this day, be happier and better because we live out our faith in it. Let our mast be before us, be the Savior's cross. It sails filled with the wind of the Holy Spirit and every uncoming, uncoming wave, the fountain is his side. Help us, protect us, and direct us in the moving sea until we reach the shore of unceasing praise. And Lord, help it not to be like Jonah, that we get taken far off and we go astray. But if we do, that you will bring us back through whatever means uh, possible. Thank you, Jesus. And bless, um, bless this um, discussion tonight, um, this mentoring time, and may it be profitable for everyone who's listening to help them guide them in their reading. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we turn our attention to this week's Torah portion, a question is often asked, why do we need the Old Testament? And I'd like to repeat this because I think it's very important because we're told quite clearly in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, 6-13 that all the things which happened in the Old Testament became our examples and happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So we need to study the Old Testament. Walter Kaiser, the famous Old Testament scholar, said, The most definitive statement from the New Testament on how the Old Testament is to be used and what roles it must play in the life of believers to be found in 2 Timothy 3.16 in Paul's admonition to Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, reproof, and correction and training up in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Since Paul had just finished referring to the sacred writings, it's clear that he has the Old Testament writings in mind. Paul urges the church to go to the Old Testament to get her doctrine and her teaching material. 
Remember on the road to Emmaus, after uh, Jesus' uh, resurrection, uh, the men were, uh, he was walking with two disciples, and he started in the Old Testament, explained all the things in the Old Testament that talked about him and what would happen to him. And so he was using the Old Testament. Um, when the Apostle Paul arrived in Berea and taught in the synagogues, the Bereans were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so, in Acts 17.11. Remember, the New Testament canon was not yet complete at that time, and so the Bereans diligently searched the Old Testament to see if what the Apostle Paul taught was according to the scriptures. And so should we use the standard of the scripture to measure to measure with um, what others may teach us? We don't put our minds on hold as believers. We are called to love God with all our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. We're, you know, it's, it's uh, perfectly permissible to ask questions, and we should. We're, you know, if we find some things we don't understand or disagree with, we should write something down. Um, I think R.C. Sproul said, uh, you're going to find things in Scripture that don't have answers, so write it in your, the, the edge of your Bible, and, and over time God will answer the question when you're reading other Scriptures as well. At the same time, Paul in Timothy 2.2 said, And the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we're commanded to mentor others. If they're younger in the faith, we're to mentor them. We're to teach them. And in 1 Corinthians, and they may be older in your faith. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 2, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. Follow the tradition of the apostles and the apostles' doctrine. Today we have the entire corpus of scriptures, body of scriptures, so we hold dearly to them. And, uh, and you know, imitate others as you, or imitate me as I imitate Christ. I remember many times watching um, Arthur Glasser in, in a classroom, and it didn't matter if he's ever, ever been there before, but he would, he would take notes of that person. And, and I think that it's so important to take notes, to, to commit these things into our mind, to, to you know, wrestle with them and, and make notes. So, you know, hope you take notes. Uh, in the Old Testament readings, we find Scripture foundationally addressing um, many things. And we're going to be looking at uh, Leviticus right now. And um, this uh, week's portion, a Torah portion, is 8th, which addresses how the priestly ministry began. And this in particular caught my attention. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. So in Leviticus 9, 6, the new King James Version says, the priestly ministry begins. And it became to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a kid of the goats as a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish, as a burnt offering, also a bull and a ram as a peace offering, to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear, uh, appear to you. Now the children of Israel, when they were doing sacrifices, they took the... Uh, the young lamb into their house, um, and they loved the lamb. And lambs are so beautiful, and they're you know, so kind. And so they would take those lambs, and they would they would have affection for it. And then they'd have to sacrifice it. So they understand that that as innocent as that lamb was, it had to die because of our sin. And uh, that's like Jesus. He was called the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sin of the world. He was perfect without blemish. And so so are those lambs, the type and shadow of the sacrifice. So they brought what Moses commanded before the tabernacle of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. Then Moses said, 
This is the thing which the Lord commanded you to do, and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. And Moses said to Aaron, Go to the altar, offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and for the people. Offer the offering of the people, and make atonement for them as the Lord commands. Aaron therefore went to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. Then the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, put it on the horns of the altar, poured the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat, the kidneys, and the fatty lobe from the liver of the skin offering, he burned on the altar, as the Lord had commanded Moses. The flesh and the hide he burned with fire outside the camp. And according to Hebrews 9.11, or 9.22, But according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. So it's kind of a... Um, and outside the camp, we can see this through, throughout the Bible. Sacrifices were taken outside the camp after they were killed. Leviticus 4.12, which we've been reading. Uh, the idea seems to be that the sin was so serious that the body of the animal that was sacrificed as a sin offering had not had to be not only destroyed, but removed, killed, burned, and then the ashes taken outside the camp. In the days of the Exodus, those who, who were ceremonially unclean were sent outside the camp. That's Numbers 5, 1 through 4. That, that's also where those who disobeyed God's law were executed, a custom that lasted at least until the New Testament times. Even today, Jews are buried outside of Jerusalem. In the days of the Exodus, those who were ceremonially unclean were sent outside the camp. Um, okay. Uh, in Whedon's commentary on the Bible, it says, Abide at the door of the tabernacle. The candidates were charged to remain within the sacred court during this probation. They could not enter the holy place or apartment of the priests because their consecration was not complete. They could not come into contact with unsanctified things without the enclosure because their consecration was begun. Here we have a fine type of Christ and his people feeding together upon the results of the accomplished atonement. Aaron and his sons, having been anointed together on the ground of the shed blood, are here presented to our view as shut in within the precincts of the tabernacle seven days. A striking figure of the present position of Christ and his members during the entire period of this dispensation, shut in with God and waiting for the manifestation of his glory. See Leviticus uh, 9.23. The charge of the Lord. This was the exact fulfillment of the commands found in Exodus 29. That ye die not, obedience is the best preparation for service. The mission of any of the prescribed ceremonies or the addition there of any human invention would prove fatal. This strictness was designed to keep this important service free from any heathen, heathenish uh, mixture. It was this verse that suggested to Charles Wesley that beautiful hymn now sung throughout Christendom. A charge to keep, I have. And, and uh, in Leviticus 10 it says, by these who came near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. And why were um, Nadab and, and Abihu um, killed? Because they offered strange fire to God, and that they were not commanded to do. They just did things on their own. And this happened throughout when kings would go in and make uh, sacrifices or make offerings or incense, and they weren't supposed to go in because they weren't um, they weren't priests. And so the priest was very specific and, um, and strict. Okay, we're now going to look at Nehemiah. Uh, Derek Kidner uh, reading his uh, commentary, which was on Nehemiah and Ezra. Interesting, Nehemiah is not as quiet a personality as Ezra, the, the scholar and reformer. He was a cupbearer to the king, which required him to be in close and protective relationship with the king and his family. Um, he had to ensure that no one would tamper with their food or drink. In those days, the, day, the king was subject to assassination by his enemies, and finding trustworthy servants was imperative. He was in a similar position as with the butler or cupbearer of the Joseph story. Remember, he was in prison, um, and so he got, uh, he got put back in, into the king's uh, service or the, the uh, 
Pharaoh's service. But um, I, I was reading a story about the 14th Dalai Lama, or actually the 13th Dalai Lama. The, the present Dalai Lama is the 14th Dalai Lama. But the four, 13th Dalai Lama was in, in Lhasa, which is the, the, the big temple in, in, uh, in Lhasa, Tibet. And um, a Mongolian em emissary came there and uh, poisoned the 13th Dalai Lama, who died. And, um, but it's an interesting story because it's uh, the basis of a story called God Spoke Tibetan, which is about the, the writing of the Tibetan Bible, of the entire Tibetan Bible. And uh, because, uh, because one of the men there was accused by, by, the, by the shaman who was there, the, the Nechang, er, uh, Nechang Oracle, um, he had to escape. And so he escapes and he goes far away in a, a part of Tibet. And uh, he actually runs into some missionaries after he settles. And the missionaries ask him, can they come there and, and can he help interpret the Bible? And he did. Uh, and that was the beginning of the writing of the New Testament. It's a great story. Anyway, Kidner comments, the main action in, Jerem in Nehemiah is crowded into the spring and summer of the year 445 BC in which Nehemiah not only made the journey from near the per Persian Gulf to Jerusalem but restored the city's walls and gates and began to see, its defense, see to its defense. His 12 years as governor oh, he, was in a, by, he was in a place called Susa um, that's where the story started because um, well let me read on his 12 years as governor and his temporary return to the imperial court have done nothing to slow down his reactions or to cool his fighting spirit. If Judaism was to earn a name for its zeal for righteousness, it owed it very largely to these two determined men, Ezra and Nehemiah. How does this start? News came to Nehemiah of the plight of Jerusalem sometime between mid-November and mid-December of 446 B.C. And then in March uh, or April of 445 in the spring when kings go to war, Nehemiah takes the initiative and approaches King Artaxerxes about his burden. He was in Susa. The citadel was the winter resort of the Persian kings at the time of his request to the king. And uh, when the matter was uh, uh, presented before the king, the king's comment on Nehemiah's dejection sprang from sudden awareness of a breach of etiquette, for a servant's private feelings are usually kept, best kept to himself, but Nehemiah decides he must act. Kind of like how Esther had to act, right? They had to take a risk. And sometimes, you know, we have to take risk like that. Nehemiah, like Esther, had the wisdom to present the matter first as news of a personal blow, not as a political issue. The king's sympathy had been enlisted and his readiness to help already made clear. Nehemiah was, no, was not vague about the project at all. I mean, he's not vague. And he had thoroughly prayed about his plan of action. It is also apparent that the queen may have been, uh, sub, have been influenced the king's decision. And that's, uh, you know, from Purim, um, from Queen Esther, the story of Esther. Uh, great story. Upon Nehemiah's impressive arrival, because uh, he comes in with troops, He's also very wise. When I think about lead, a leadership course, I, I, took, uh, I, I took my master's at uh, Fuller was uh, on Christian, uh, introducing change into Christian organizations. And I think highly of Nehemiah, who was a model of good sense, piety, and attention to detail. For all his speed and drive, he doesn't rush into action or into talk. He carefully surveys the walls at night. He goes around the walls. And he has not only kept his plan from the enemy, he's kept the initiative private, but he's considered those he must convince and, and he arose to you know, take action. So he looks at those enemies like Symbala and Tobiah and, and Nehemiah uh, definitely will, will uh, say that this battle belongs to the Lord and that uh, he declares that, that Symbala is not going to make any you know, lasting monument here. You know, and so he, he, he's a very prayerful person. 
He's very, you know, he, he plans. He, he views the wall of Jerusalem. He looks at all the different walls. And so he, he, makes, he makes plans to rebuild the wall. And uh, I think a, a lot about that when we're you know, looking at rebuilding a wall across America. And not just America, you know, the northern border, the southern border, and in the cities. You know, it's like he's looking at all these things. And, and, and he's reinstituting things like the Feast of Tabernacles. And, you know, Ezra, you know, reads the law, and he's there. And uh, he has people that are helping the people understand because the people need to understand. Okay, we're also this week looking at Romans, looking at chapters 1 through 7, and I'm looking at uh, uh, the commentary on Romans, which is excellent. It's a series of, I think, six or so books uh, or more by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Martin Lloyd-Jones was an English physician to royalty before he was called to be an expositor. He got pretty tired um, of seeing people who got healed and then just go back out and send some more. He rather wanted to see their tra spiritual transformation, so they wouldn't sin. And one of the greatest minds in English literature, this is um, uh, in the commentary, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge said that Romans is the profoundest piece of writing in existence. So when you're reading Romans and you think, I can't understand this, I don't be too disheartened. It's going to take a lot of reading. And um, we too must ask ourselves, have I realized all this about this epistle, this, this letter to the Romans? As I've gone through my Bible, have I stopped at this book? Have I paused at it and given my time in it? Have I realized its profundity? Martin Luther says, and he's talking about this book, Martin Luther, the, this epistle is the chiefest part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel, which indeed deserves that a Christian should not only know it word for word by heart, but deal with it daily as with the daily bread of the soul. It's an epistle written by a man called Paul. Uh, so that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing. This is Martin Luther, and he was brilliant. He uh, was going to be trained as an attorney, but he became the, uh, really the, one of the you know, first initiators of the Reformation. Uh, but this epistle of Romans is written by, Paul, uh, by a man named Paul, called Paul. He is writing a letter like this to a company of Christian people in the great city of Rome. Kind of think of, you know, Los Angeles or New York or something in great cities, the majority of which were Gentiles, you know, people that weren't Jewish. And he was previously Saul of Tarsus, a rigid, rabid, nationalistic Jew, hating the Lord Jesus Christ and everything connected with him, regarding him as a blasphemer. Um, a blasphemer trying to destroy the Christian church and going to Damascus, a sign to exterminate the little church growing there. He was born a Roman citizen. So he was a man of culture. He knew Greek. He knew the Greek poets. He could, he could quote them. He knew the Greek philosophers. And he was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. And who was Gamaliel? Uh, he was superbly trained uh, by this, this wise and Jewish teacher, He's a member of the ruling council of the Sanhedrin, which is a group of 70 men that were part of the Sanhedrin, very wise men. And Gamaliel's renown is summed up in the words recorded in the Talmud, which is one of the books that, that the you know, Jews write about um, the Bible, but it's, it's commentary. It's not you know, biblical. Uh, when Rabbi Gamaliel, the elder, died, regard for the Torah, the Jewish law, ceased, and purity and piety died. This is a high compliment of, of this teacher. The New Testament relates that Gamaliel intervened on behalf of the apostles of Jesus when they had seized and brought, uh, they were brought to the Sanhedrin. Another passage in Acts 22.3 tells how St. Paul, in a speech to the Jews, tried to influence them by stating that he had been a student of Gamaliel. I'm a Jew brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. So he had, you know, be like saying, oh yeah, I, I, I learned under, under, you know, John MacArthur or, or R.C. Sproul or something like that. You're, you're sitting under these great people. According 
to the Jewish encyclopedia, Gamaliel appears also as a prominent member of the Sanhedrin in the account given in Acts, where he is called a Pharisee and a doctor of the law, much honored by the people. He, he is there made to speak in favor of the disciples of Jesus, who were threatened with death. For if this counsel, and he said, For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. That's a pretty powerful statement. And it, uh, it saved those uh, disciples' life, and they were able to go out and preach. So, uh, and Paul was really highly knowledgeable about the Jewish laws, and his previous knowledge and skills made him, after his salvation and encounter with Jesus, a formidable defender of the Christian faith. Well, you're going to be reading through uh, Romans chapter 1, greetings, desire to visit Rome, you know, and quotes that uh, you know, we should memorize. The just will live by faith. Uh, God's wrath on unri- unrighteousness. And you know, when you, if you read, um, we're reading uh, one of the most quoted uh, scriptures that we often hear is in Romans. 118, where it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And it's really the answer to the question about when people say, well, what if they haven't heard? Well, it's revealed in heaven, in all creation. I mean, you listen to the animals, the birds. Um, I, I was talking to a, um, a fellow uh, patient uh, at, at the dialysis, and they were saying um, that they have this, it's a, What's it called? Merlin oh, it's from MIT, right? Uh, from, I think it's. I think it was made at MIT. It's called Merlin ID, and it can actually tell you what birds are in the area. You know, the, it can. It'll interpret the birds. I mean, it's. It's a bird. A bird. Bird. Bird tweet uh, identification. So, obviously, if they can talk about. Uh, you know, the tweets, they can sure uh, interpret our, our voice and know who we are. So, so as you're reading um, the scriptures, it's, it's very, very clear that um, uh, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known, what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but be- became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into the images make, made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So instead of, I mean, they, they start worshiping the birds or they worship the fish, you know, made Dagon. They make, they make idols, you know, they have hands and feet, but, but ears and eyes, but they, they can't speak. They're dumb. They're just idols. They're stone or they're metal or they're wood. Therefore, God also gave them up to the uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature, the idols and the birds and the things, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And I did that for 14 years as a Buddhist. You know, and God gave me over to those kind of vile passions. And, um, and, and because we weren't retaining a knowledge of God, and um, you know our mind was becoming more debased. But, but because of the love of Christ, and you know the, you know the believers, you know sharing, 
uh, you know, shared the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, you know, that's what we're to do as well. Well, anyway, um, Romans is great. I mean, it's such an important book to spend a lot of time there and rereading it. Uh, God's Righteous Judgment, and in chapter 2, the Jews are guilty as the Gentiles. Um, so it's, you know, neither Jew nor Greek. It's, it's one new man. We all, um, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, God's judgment is defy, defended, and all have sinned. And, and I did post something I highly recommend. Um, it, because if you're in an area where you have Catholics, or you're coming from a Catholic background, or you're in churches that are influenced by Roman Catholicism, um, and we all are, by the way, um, you can't escape it. I mean, even all the justices in the Supreme Court, are not, they're not Protestants. They're Roman Catholics. So we are a country that's very much influenced by Roman Catholicism. Um, the clearest explanation of the difference between the Roman Catholic doctrine, the Roman Catholic, not the Roman, not the Catholic. You know, we are Catholic means universal church, and we are part of the universal church. But there is a Roman Catholic church, which is out of Rome, um, their doctrine of justification by faith and the biblical uh, view of evangelicals and Protestants um, is uh, done by uh, R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul, who was the head of, uh, founder of um, Legionnaires. He uh, really explains it very carefully. He lays out this important doctrine um, biblically and honestly and historically because uh, sometimes we don't really understand and so we'll say, will say certain things. I highly recommend listening to it. I did uh, type out some notes in it. I'm just going to go over them. It might be a little difficult, but I'm learning. You know, I'm trying to understand the doctrines of the faith and get a clear, you know, clear understanding. So you know, we we um, we you know help others others understand. And um, you know, after COVID, a lot of people, well, the Rome, the Catholic Church were closed, and so a lot of Roman Catholics came, uh, started coming to church. Um, that were, churches were open, Protestant churches, and so it was. It was a big transition for them. Uh, well, the, this is uh, some of the notes I just typed out. And they're not as clear as I'd like them to be, but um, you know, just bear with me. The difference between the Reformation and the biblical view of justification and the Roman Catholic Church. That's what he's talking about. There are probably many priests who actually believe in sola scriptura, the essence of the gospel, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the truth of the word of God. Um, and, you know, some will believe in sola fide. Sola fide means by faith alone, by grace alone, you know, that we're saved, not as a result of works, um, you know, lest that any man should boast. Well, the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, its official doctrine is defined in the councils of Trent, in its sixth council, where they defined the doctrine in the 16th century, so that's a long time ago, and proclaimed these uh, anathemas. And what does that mean? It said that, that if you do believe in a doctrine differently than this, you're cursed and you'll never go to heaven. And so they basically cursed all the people in the Reformation. You're never going to go to heaven because you, you believe in you know, the, uh, by faith alone, by grace alone. So they call us heretics. And even in the Second Council, uh, or the, um, the Vatican, what was it? Vatican II. Vat yeah, in Vatican II, um, they, you know, they, they kind of softened a lot of things, and they wanted to call us, you know, um, a strange brethren or whatever. Um, and they were trying to bring the Protestants home, they say. Um, but they did not cancel the anathemas, the curses on us. And so those curses, you know, undeserved curse will return to its maker. But um, so this, the brief understanding of the Roman Catholic, let's talk about this, the brief understanding of the Roman Catholics and their doctrine of faith. We sometimes misinterpret their justification of faith. In the main, they say faith in Jesus Christ is necessary. So you go, yeah, they believe in Jesus. So you have to have faith in Jesus. They say it is the um, the... The, 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 the beginning. 
It's the foundation, it's the root of justification. Rome took a strong view in having faith, but although they say it is a necessary component, it's not enough. And you'll listen to R.C. Sproul, he'll explain it better. If you have mortal faith, uh, if, you have, if, you do more, if you have a mortal sin, you can lose your salvation. Okay, as a Christian, um, all of our sins are forgiven. So you're not going to lose your sin, uh, lose your f- salvation. Um, but for them, it's not faith alone. It is, it has to be something more. In the first instance, um, they say the instrumental cause, the means of how justification is communicated to the believer, is at baptism. The work of baptism is poured into the believer. Now, if you read the history of mission, <laughs> It's really, it's really sad because you would go to Sri Lanka or India and you just you say, we have so many Christians, but all they did is baptize people. They, they didn't even know what they were doing. You know, they might be getting uh, money um, you know, to be Christians. Um, they call them rice Christians. It wasn't sincere you know, faith. It was just it was because the, the colonializers or... Uh, the missionaries had money or jobs, etc., and so they would they would just uh, they would just take baptism. So they said, if you're baptized, you're now a Christian. Well, that's not the case. Just because we're baptized, we're not Christians. They're saying you must cooperate with baptism because you're now in a state of justification. So you're saved. You you know um, you know you can go go straight to heaven. But if you commit mortal sin, you will lose your salvation. So if you made shipwreck of your faith. Mortal sin kills your soul. But, they said, you can be restored through the sacrament of penance. Did you ever see uh, the mission? You know, where, where the, the, the soldier, he commits a sin, and, um, and so he goes up the waterfalls, and he's carrying a cross. That's an pe- act of penance. So you have to do good works. Um, and that, at the time, was the, in, in the Reformation was the eye in the eye of the storm of the controversy. You confess your sin. Um, you know, you have an act of, you have to confess your sin to the priest, and then you have to do, you know, an act of contrition. You have to say, you know, so many um, Hail Marys or or you have to cry out to the saints or, you know, etc. Or, you know, so many our fathers. And um, um, I mean Christ did give priests, you know, the the thing that they can forgive people of sins, you know, it's like it's, if you know, you're in, in, on earth as in heaven. But after that came works of satisfaction in order to be restored to the faith. So it's faith plus works, okay? Faith plus works. So if you did some mortal sin and you had to do something, you had to climb up the, climb up that waterfall and you had to carry the cross and, and you had to, you know, you know, do your rosary, rosaries over and over, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But you know that um, uh, being, uh, the Bible condemns vain repetition. You know, of hail marys. Um, you know, as Buddhists, we had to we had to chant so many things, and and we had beads, so you could count. You know, a million, and I did a million of those. I mean, three hours a day, I was chanting, and. Uh, but that's a vanity. It's like it's not going to earn you a way into heaven. And same in your know, Roman Catholicism. So there's beads and those things. Or in other, other uh, traditions. Uh, you have to do works of satisfaction. Now, how do you satisfy God? Well, through these works of satisfaction. You have to do our fathers, Hail Marys, and then purchases of indulgence. If you saw the, the film uh, Luther, you see Luther goes to Rome and uh, there's these steps uh, called the Lateran steps. I think those steps were uh, brought back from Jerusalem. from Jerusalem, where Jesus was crucif- crucified or walked on, or or in Pilate or in the Praetorium. I think it was somewhere. And if you know, just you know, let me know. I'll make a comment online. But he would um, he got to Rome and he saw all these people going up the steps. And they'd have to pay indulgences to, you know, to, to you know, save their, their mother or their father, or their aunt or uncle, their kids or whatever, their wife, uh, in, 
that might be in purgatory. And so um, this was just a, um, a money-raising scheme. Um, they said it was a you know, work of satisfaction, but it was really a money-raising scheme to build that, those amazing buildings in Rome. You know, St. Peter's Basilica didn't get built uh, by, you know, by nothing. It got built by money. And so watch the film on Luther. It's, it kind of gets into that. But they'd have to go every step, and they get bloody legs. And, and then you see sometimes the, um, the priest uh, beating themselves. Or you know, see that uh, in different countries where they're, they're taking these whips, you know, the whips that Jesus got whipped with, so they're whipping themselves. We don't have to do those things. We don't have to. Jesus took those stripes on our behalf on Calvary. I mean, it says by his stripes we are healed. We didn't have to go through that. But um, these works give a type of merit. And if you look at it, that's like, I mean, in Buddhism, it's merit-based. You have to do merit. You have to you know, chant so many things. You have to do so many good works, etc., and so the, the Catholics are doing, uh, they have to do meritorious works. But we don't have to do merit. I mean, the merit is all by Christ alone. Um, but these types of merit are called um, condign merit. So you have to have condign merit so, so high that you get a reward from God. So you're pleasing God. So some of these people say, "Well, I, I beat myself, or I, I walk on, you know, walk on my knees." Now, I think a lot personally. I think a lot of the, the, the Buddhist Tibetan Buddhist practices, are borrowed from Roman Catholicism, because they, the the Buddhists will walk on their hands for for miles, um, and you know, and the walk on their hands, clap, you know, they'll get bloody, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's it's a merit-based religion. It's works-based. So most religions are works-based. Well, I'm going to please God by doing... You don't have to please God that way because God is pleased by the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice of His Son. You know, we all have sinned and gone astray. So none of us are perfect. And so our works are basically impure. You know, even our attitude is sometimes impure. But Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God. And so that's who was, who was sacrificed at Calvary. Okay, so, um, so these, there's, these con, there's another kind of merit, congruous merit. And um, they, um, they, they want this to be fit so much that you have God to restore your salvation. So who, who's actually judging that merit? I mean, seriously, who's judging the merit? We are? Or the priests are judging the merit. The priests are imperfect. The Pope is imperfect. You know, his papal infallibility, like he doesn't make a mistake. Well, we know that's not true. This present Jesuit Pope has made, made the case over and over. I mean, he's, he goes against the Bible. Um, so, um, so to have God restore your salvation, it's, that becomes grace plus merit. And... We are saved by grace, not a result of works, lest any man should boast. That's scripture. That's sola scriptura. We're just using the word, we're understanding in the word of God. So the biggest issue, Rome points out that God will never declare a person just. Unless you are just, you can't become inherently just without Christ. (coughs) Christ is perfect. So if you die in the state of inherent righteousness, you go straight to heaven. But uh, if you have one imperfection on your record, you go to Mass every day, you go to confession, and this happens in the Nazarene Church. They're, they're, um, they're people that believe that you have to do everything perfectly every day. So if, you have, if you're making, you know, you're doing some sin that night and you die in your sleep, you don't go to heaven. You die with imperfection. You and then the, the Roman Catholics think, well, you've got to go to the purging place. You've got to go. And, and R.C. Sproul said, that's the worst news I've ever heard. That's horrible news. 
The great news about justification alone is when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, God imputes and applies the perfect righteousness of Jesus to my account because he died on our behalf and that righteousness was imputed to me. Is that a great, that's great news. It's like, um, it doesn't mean we're justified without fruit. I mean, the righteousness is a fruit of our faith. The only righteousness which is good enough is Jesus's, Jesus Christ's righteousness and his alone. What Paul was saying to the Judaizers was that it's not by the works of the law, and because by the works of the law, no faith will be, no flesh will be justified, right? We, but we are in a state of reconciliation with God the moment I receive Christ, or we receive Christ and Him alone. And that's uh, when I came to faith. You know, um, I believed in Jesus Christ and Him alone for my salvation, and it's like His death alone is my justification. Well, okay, that's that. Um, now. Uh, there's another, uh, another, uh, that video is on, I think, a playlist. Um, it wasn't on my playlist, but it was with John MacArthur. And uh, it was quite interesting because John MacArthur said, what's at stake here? He said, it's going to offend some Roman Catholics, but nothing is as loving as speaking what is true. So um, even the reformers, you know, they got all persecuted and they got thrown out of their churches because they were nonconformists, you know, under Bloody Mary. They loved their, their, their Roman Catholic neighbors. You know, they, they want to see them know the entire truth because the truth will set you free. And uh, in the U.S., we've kind of got a little bit wishy-washy, quite frankly, in the document Catholics and Evangelicals together, if you've ever seen that. Because... We have to understand what is the gospel. Are those in Christendom saved just because they believe in Jesus? Um, uh, the mood in evangelicalism, this is what MacArthur is saying, is to embrace all Roman Catholics and the Pope, but as the Pope is the greatest leader. But that's not true. It's a long war on truth, and Roman Catholicism has been the greatest enemy of the church. Um, I mean, yes, some of the... Uh, some of the early church fathers are good, and, and they define some of the issues. But some of these councils, um, they twisted the truth. And there's, you know, the worship of saints and veneration of angels and uh, the twisting of the ac sacraments of the Mass. I mean, you know, the Mass is, you know, we're not uh, cannibals. We're not drinking the blood and the, the body, eating the body of Christ. We're actually... It's a representation of the blood and the body of Christ. And, um, you know, purgatory. And purgatory is not there. You know, purgatory, you might as well be reincarnated, right? You know, it's like, oh, I'll be reincarnated. I'll get my, my life right. And uh, MacArthur said people, you know, take purgatory as a safety net where people set it straight and, you know, you know get everything, uh, you know, you know, get everything set straight. You know, if you send, you know, you'll, You'll be there for so long. Priests say you're in a long road to perfection. That sounds like the human potential movement to me. That's not biblical. And um, so there's a false gospel of works working there. And the papacy is you know, Pope. He's at the top of the church. Is, and reformers always knew this. It was papal infallibility. He is the God. He is God incarnate on earth. Well, certainly if you follow this Pope and look at what he's doing, it's not true at all. Um, he's uh, he's he, he bows to whatever the culture wants, and uh, you know I've seen it with uh, you know friends that that uh, their their sisters are nuns and they you know get into uh, doing all sorts of um, pagan rites in in uh, South America. You know they're not preaching the gospel. Um, they're they're syncretist. They're they're uh, you know, they're doing whatever they want. But, you know, John Knox, the reformers, they, they sought to counteract the Pope. And Cramner and the Westminster Confession, they knew there's, they declared there's no other head of the church but Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and 
in people like Spurgeon, you know, he talks about the Antichrist and the popery of the church. People that have been in the Roman Catholic Church understand that. Many friends have been in the Roman Catholic Church, they understand that. They and they also understand that there are there are believers within the Roman Catholic Church, and we understand that there are unbelievers in the Christian Church that don't understand the doctrines of the faith. And so we need to understand that. During 1153 to 1558, during the reign of Bloody Mary, you know, many, many um, of the, the, the priests, the ministers, fled the country. And then 300 of the ministers stayed behind. They were burned at the stake. And uh, these people, Ridley and Latimer and William Taylor, were martyred for translating the Bible into English. And, and um, if, you, if, you, um, if you were in the early church, you know, um, in the early church in England, you would be reading Fox's Book of the Martyrs. And it talks about the martyrdom of, you know, William Tyndale and, and um, you know, um, so many of these stories. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable compilation by John Fox and other original, other eminent authorities. And it was the dates and the monuments of these um, latter perilous days. So it's, it's a, an amazing book about how these martyrs went to the stake and for their faith. And, um, and we're, we're in a century where we're kind of, kind of far removed from some of those things, but not, not worldwide. There are martyrs around the world. Well, okay. Um, and that's probably enough on that today. But uh, that's Romans, so you're looking at justified by faith. Um, and we also read uh, a proverb, so I'm going to read Proverbs 17, 21 through 18, 5. There's one, it's called, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Proverbs 17, 22. I was reading uh, Charles Bridges' commentary on this proverb, and it struck me that God is definitely calling us Christians who may be susceptible to a brooding spirit of despondency, who have a tendency towards always looking at the dark side of things, to watch our attitude, lest we become discontent and querulous. A person defined as someone described as one who is constantly or habitually complaining, um, or fretful or whining. You know, people are just always whining. But it's not good to be Christians that are whining. You know, God's on the throne. God takes care of our needs. You know, just you know to be still and know the, um, that God is God is on our side. You know. And as we uh, read the book of Acts, we, well, we come upon Paul and Silas, who are locked up tight, their feet in the stocks to prevent their escape. Do they whine and fret? Not at all. They sang praises to God. What do we find ourselves doing when we're locked up in a particular situation? Do we commit ourselves and our situation to prayer and seek what it, what it is he would have us do? The martyrs glorified God in the fire. They were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. That's in Hebrews 15, 13. All earthly enjoyments are now doubly, doubly blessed with heavenly sunshine. Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 9. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and let your head lack no ointment. And quite frankly, over the years, God has been working with me. And as we've gone through many trials, I've slowly learned to let the trial do its work in me. Breaking my pride, softening my heart to others with compassion, and receiving the love of God in the midst of some very difficult passages. And when in the midst of trials, we see God more clearly. I read Richard Steele's plain discourse on uprightness. And he said, he that would be wise, let him read the Proverbs. He that would be holy, let him read the Psalms. And in my last trip to the hospital, when I was in a deep, dark valley, nothing would bring me solace except cry out to God uh, as Elizabeth read the Psalms. 
and I would loudly cry out, repeating those prayers of God, uh, of da the King David, long ago. At the end, I was literally prayed out and exhausted, I guess arriving at the emergency room at 10 in the morning and finally being admitted and rolled into the hospital room at 5 a.m. had a bit to do with that exhaustion and exasperation. But the hospital staff treated me exceptionally well in the midst of my medical emergency, and for which we're extremely grateful. But praying those prayers in that condition, I had no other source of solace to which to turn. I identified with the agony in which um, King David cried out to God in his affliction, as expressed in the Psalms. And we, we realized that I mean, King David was fleeing, you know, King Saul. I can, yeah, King Saul, who had you know, thrown, thrown um, javelins at him in, in the, the throne room um, and hunted him down in the mountains with troops. So he was, he was in trouble, but he realized that God is a very present help in times of trouble, and so should we. It's, uh, Bridges continues in his commentary, a broken spirit in an evangelical sense, is God's precious gift, stamped with his special honor, and always constituting an acceptable service. But here it describes a brooding spirit, as previously mentioned, which centers in a spurious humility centering in self. We've, we all heard the whining complaints of others and then in ourselves. The psalmist, Davis would say, some, the psalmist David, David would say to himself, why, O oh soul, are you so disquieted in me? Hope in God, for I will still praise him. Well, I'm running out of battery. I'm really sorry. Um, but I want to post this uh, for others. So God bless you and keep reading. All right? God be with you.